night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. We have a great show for you tonight. We're going to be talking about some very, very interesting topics. Again, things we don't always get a chance to talk about here on the show, but we will tonight. In the first part of the program, we're going to have a medical doctor, Dr. Dennis Durrell, in with us and he'll be talking about the state of hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic. What's going on? We've heard conflicting reports. Dr. Durrell will have some answers for us. And then in the second part of the show, author Dean Reuter will be here to talk about his book called The Hidden Nazi. It documents the role of an SS general, Hans Kemmler, in the Holocaust and in Germany's secret weapon programs and his suicide at the end of the war. Was that real? What happened uh, with the Americans? Were they involved? Was technology involved? We'll find out all about that with Dean Reuter. He's also going to talk about the differences between the, the issues we're facing today in an unprecedented lockdown of the country versus what uh, our grandparents, in many cases, there were our grandparents, faced during the World War II years. A lot of interesting stuff tonight. I'm really looking forward to our conversations. As always, I encourage you to join us on the YouTube channel. If you haven't found it yet, just go to YouTube and search for J.V. Johnson. The name of the channel is J.V. Johnson's Beyond Paranormal. And we have an opportunity for you there to view many, many back episodes, like 500 or so. Plus, when the show streams live, we have a chat room that is a lot of fun, a lot of great people there. And I welcome all of you to our chat room. And I say hello to everybody who's there now. Good to see you all there, of course. Also, the podcast version of the show is available on all major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and others. If you find it there, subscribe. If you get to the YouTube channel, which I would encourage you to do, please subscribe. The subscriptions help help us uh, do all the things we're trying to do here. All right, so let's go to break because we have a lot to cover tonight. So we'll go to break. We'll bring our first guest in after the break. Dr. Dennis Durrell will talk about the state of hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Joha. That's J-O-H-A-W. As I said, coming up in the second part of the program, Dean Reuter, he's an author, will be talking about his book called The Hidden Nazi. That'll be an interesting conversation. But before we do that, we have another interesting conversation. Our first guest of the evening, Dr. Dennis Durrell, is a medical doctor. He also has a book. His book is called Your Healthcare Playbook, Winning the Modern Game of Medicine. Dr. Durrell, welcome to Beyond Reality. It's great to have you here tonight. Hey, it's good to be here. Thank you. So, uh, because our time is short, I want to jump right into this. Give me a sense of what's happening around the country. We all know that we're in uncharted territory in a lot of ways, in, in many, many ways. Um, but none of which, or the, the, the least of which is not uh, what's going on in our hospitals. What's happening in American hospitals today? Well, um, unbelievably, many of them now are half full. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, un, it's ironic that in the middle of the worst pandemic that we've seen in, in, you know, almost a hundred years, uh, essentially that we would have empty hospitals. If you're in a hot spot, that's not the case. And, and, you know, we're seeing that in, uh, for example, my practice, we have 19 states, 2000 doctors. And in some of our practices in hot spots, and like outside of Chicago, uh, we're certainly seeing normal volume, not excessive volume, you know, not overwhelmed. I think New York City was the closest to becoming overwhelmed, and they weren't overwhelmed in the sense that, you know, four people were being put on a ventilator. Um, so, but other than the hot spots, we actually have empty, you know, half full emergency rooms. Our volume is 50% of what it normally is, and people are afraid to go to the hospital. And I think that we got a little draconian with the idea of shelter in place, safer at home. That's true. That is true. Certainly, social distancing and isolation has helped flatten the curve. There's no doubt. But there's been a side effect. And the side effect is that people are afraid to come to the ER for something like a heart attack or a stroke. And in that case, time is of the essence. And we can open an artery and save heart function. And I talked to a cardiologist the other day, a patient, stayed home, had heart, chest pain, thought it was COVID, came in four days later, and now they won't ever have that heart function back, and they're going to have heart failure for the rest of their life. So, I, you know, my thing is we've got to be more nuanced with our messaging and realize that, you know, we're a big country, 
If you had a blizzard in New York and Seattle, you wouldn't shut schools in Miami. Uh, we need to treat this regionally and temper our message. I guess that was going to be my next question. Did we overreact by making most of these restrictions uh, nationwide as opposed to handling them region by region and addressing them as we saw the need? Yes, and I think elective surgeries are a classic example. You take an area of West Virginia uh, with very low incidence of COVID. You've got a rural hospital that's supporting that community. You take away elective surgeries. Uh, and now that's 60% of the hospital's revenue. They might close. They're furloughing employees now. The patients don't get surgeries they need. The hospital had plenty of PPE, uh, plenty of beds, plenty of space. You could stop the elective surgeries very quickly and not have an overwhelming number of patients in the hospital. And, yeah, I think exactly. I think it should have been more nuanced. And if you look at the reopen plan, you'll notice, for elective surgeries, they're bringing them back, and they're saying everything that I just said. If we have PPE, if we have a low incidence. And so I think we could have ridden through this and done some of that. So do you think this was just an abundance of caution, an overreaction, a, a giant mistake, or somewhere in the middle of all that? I, I hate to call it an overreaction, you know, because, you know, we, ha- we just don't know with a novel virus uh, what it's going to do. So I wouldn't say it's an overreaction. I think it just uh, could have been tempered. Uh, and I think that once we started to see that it wasn't spreading as fast as we thought, we should have adjusted course and we waited too long. And I do think a little bit of it was covering your, you know, covering your behind. It was like, you know, we told you not to do that. So, um, and I'm not in favor of that. I think patients are going to suffer because of that. I have a, a, a very good friend who's a senior administrator at a hospital here in Cooperstown, New York, where I live. And, uh, you know, talking about the consequence of the elimination or temporary suspension of elective surgeries, that, that particular hospital is already struggling financially and already, already having a difficult time. Do you think this may result in the loss of some of our smaller and regional hospitals? There's no doubt. There is no doubt. I mean, you're looking at companies like HCA that have 180 hospitals, and their revenue is down. Their EBITDA is down 13% a quarter. I mean, they're going to be able to suffer this, this tragedy. But the rural hospitals, they're, work, they're operating too close to their margin. And most of their income really comes from these procedures and surgeries. And we're going to lose hospitals because of it. And by the way, I went to Albany Med, so... We sent uh, students to Cooperstown, That's so right. uh, I'm familiar with that. Another thing, that, and this may not be uh, something that you've taken a look at specifically because it's rather new, but another thing that had me a bit concerned is some of this, these uh, restrictions that are being announced about uh, visas and work visas, because I also know that the hospital here relies heavily on um, what I guess we would call foreign doctors, foreign medical personnel, because they can't seem to get uh, domestic uh, doctors and domestic medical personnel here because they're in short supply. There's no doubt. Um, you know, we, we our company. So my, I'm the head of our hospitals division across the U.S. And we have many foreign grads. They're they're outstanding clinicians. Uh, and in certain areas, that's you know all we can get. And I and I don't mean that in a bad way. Uh, so I'm not in favor of cutting down on very high skilled uh, immigrants ever. Not not right now in particular. Let's talk about the reason that some patients who may normally have made a trip to the emergency room aren't doing so. You used an example of uh, somebody who, was ha- who had a heart attack, basically, didn't go to the ER until several days later. Are these people afraid of going to the ER because they're afraid of contracting COVID, or are they not going because they, they are hearing that these ERs are swamped and overrun? I think it's a combination of things. You know, when I talk to the CEOs of our hospitals that we work with, they're now trying to get out campaigns on their websites to show that there aren't guards. uh, You know, it's not pandemonium. There aren't guards guarding, not letting people in ERs. You know, and I think that, that that's one of the problems is that if you look at the TV and you look at New York and they're showing places that are overwhelmed, there's an assumption that it's local. Uh, and I think that's part of it. The second thing is they're afraid of getting it, of course. Uh, 
Uh, the truth is that when you come into an ER, if you if we think you have it, you're isolated immediately. And parts of the hospital, uh, if you have it, you're going to go to a certain wing of the hospital. And, and other than really overwhelmed places, you're really not going to be in contact with it. Plus, every doctor and nurse now working in a hospital is wearing a mask all the time uh, to protect patients because, as you know, many people are asymptomatic. Uh, and I think that's part of it. And I think some of it is a guilt thing. You know, I don't want to take a bed for someone that might need it. Again, all based on areas that are overwhelmed, which really New York City has been the only one in the U.S., and I think they see that on TV, and and they think that's their local uh, scenario. So we've been helping hospitals try to get the word out that it's safe to come in. I hate to sound callous as I ask this next question, but I'm not sure how to ask it and make it sound more sensitive, but I do mean it in a very sensitive way. But are there statistics about people that have suffered, whether it's heart failure, heart heart attacks, or other conditions that would have been uh, treated at an ER that haven't gone to the ER? Do are those uh, numbers st- st- statistically significant? Yes. Uh, well, we know that you know, depending on your data set, you know, one set looked at twelve major hospitals, and supposedly myocardial infarctions were down forty percent, and that's hard data. And then. Just talking to other hospitals, we hear about 50% uh, less heart attacks, and and, the, and we know that, that that can't be true. I mean, COVID didn't cure it. Right. And so we have to assume they had them, and they have, and I think we're going to find that, and we are seeing. So my doctors across the country are seeing the people that do come in, they're coming in later. Uh, it's well documented. You know, uh, on Twitter they had a, a patient that had a heart attack, and ruptured their ventricle. So there's a right and left ventricle, and the septum in between separates it. You almost never have a rupture of that in a heart attack. But if you wait too long to come in, that can happen, and they were showing the echo of that on Twitter, and I think that's what we're seeing. One of the things that might be a silver lining in all of this, and I'm really anxious to hear your opinion about it, but uh, there's been a move to some telemedicine. Is that a good thing that's coming out of this? And are we sparking a bit of an evolution, maybe even a revolution of telemedicine? Yes, absolutely. Um, it was amazing. You know, we telemedicine's been around for 30 years, but uh, during a pandemic, all of a sudden Medicare said, guess what? You don't have to have a HIPAA-compliant platform. That's our law to protect privacy. You can just do it on Zoom or you can do it on FaceTime. And then they eventually said you could just do it by a phone call. And, I mean, it's remarkable that in three months they moved to deregulate something that had taken years and years of pushing to do. So, absolutely, one silver lining is a lot more virtual visits, a lot more telemedicine in the future. It'll be hard to roll all of that back. People learned how to do it. They learned how to do it from home, even chronically ill patients. And I think that's been an amazing thing. We're going to see a lot more of that in the future. Putting the telemedicine component aside, I'm hearing a lot of things about uh, apps for smartphones that monitor uh, ill patients or sick patients or or COVID-19 infected people. Um, I'm hearing uh, state governments looking for ways to track and to survey some of this information. And my first thought was, how can they get away with this with the HIPAA regulations and the, and the, 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 the right we have to medical privacy? Are you concerned that some of these lines might be uh, crossed? Well, you know, I think, yes, I think if you're going to make people do things and make people share them, then I think that's a problem. If they volunteer to do it, it's different. Um, And my only caution would be, so I think that we're going to be more liberal with this HIPAA law. We always thought it was a little bit restrictive anyway. Um, So I think we're going to see some liberalization of that. But I think for most of these people are going to opt in. But if you make me do it and report, that's going to be different. Uh, And I, you know, I I want to take a second. I, I, if you don't mind, I have an app that I developed called My Doc Replay. And we developed it, you know, two years ago. But for now, when you can't visit your loved one in the hospital or a nursing home, you can record the visit with your doctor. And then in our app, you can share it in a compliant way with your family out of state. And that's been a really big deal. And we make it free. It's free on Android and Apple. So people should take advantage if they have a loved one in the hospital to use My Doc Replay. My Doc Replay. That's the name of the app? That's it. 
and it's on Apple and Android. And, you know, we've been, we've had it out there before the, the pandemic, of course, because we think if you see your doctor and your wife can't come or your, my dad has a visit down in Georgia, I can watch the video of the doctor and the doctor agrees and I can see it instantly and, and explain things to him. So it's really important to uh, capture that, to let people see it again and again. And now it's just been great because people can't visit their loved ones and sit there and talk to the doctor in the hospital. But if they use this app, they can share it with them. We've talked about visits to the ER and these, uh, what well, I guess we would call sudden onset type illnesses that people need immediate help for that they may be waiting. What about more chronic illnesses, things like cancer patients, uh, things that people uh, go to the hospital, whether it's for uh, maybe chemotherapy type treatments or they're actually in a hospital bed for uh, some days at a time. Has that been affected by this at all? Yes, I do think that there's been some cancer patients that have not, they've been had their chemotherapy put on hold. I think there are patients that have COPD or lung disease that are at home that would have come in, and they're kind of tinkering right on that edge, a teetering of coming in. Uh, and, and I think that there's been some delay in some diagnostic testing that should be done. And everyone says, well, that's fine. They'll eventually come in. Well, guess what? When you have 22 million people lose their jobs and then you lose your health insurance, yeah. let's not say that all these are going to actually always eventually be done because they won't. Well, wow, that's a great point, too, and I hadn't really considered that. But the fact that uh, so many people have lost their jobs and with those jobs, their health care probably went as well. What happens with this situation? How do we get around this hurdle? This is a difficult hurdle. You know, I did read that uh, the Congress is considering extending COBRA. COBRA, as you know, if you lose your insurance, you can keep it for up to six months, but it's so prohibitively expensive if you use it. And what I, I have heard that in one of the phases, obviously it hasn't happened yet, but I've heard that they're going to try to make COBRA be a very minimal cost or possibly have the employer pay for that COBRA coverage. So, um, more on that to come. That's something to watch out for. Let's talk about COVID-19 itself. Where does this fall in the scale of pandemics? And I don't know what would be the upper end and what would be the lower end, but give give us a sense of how infectious this is and how dangerous it is, or or how dangerous it isn't. I don't know where you fall on this. Yeah, I mean, first of all, if you think about the plague, the, you know, the, the plague, that was 500 million. If you talk about that means 500 million worldwide dead. That right. was a different different infection. It was a bacteria. And if you talk about the 1918 pandemic, that was, depending on who you, you agree with, 70 to 100 million. Uh, if you talk about, you know, 1968 uh, flu, uh, that was 1 million. 1957, 2 million. So that gives you an idea. And several years ago, we had a flu outbreak. So in uh, 2017, 18, where we had 80,000 deaths. And so, you know, that kind of puts it in perspective. And I, I don't want, mean to sound callous about deaths and throwing these numbers around, but we're at 46,000. My belief is, depending on when you t- cut the time off, we're going to be a bad flu season. You know, we're probably going to be, by this time it's said and done at the end of these, this year, say December, we're probably going to be in that, you know, 80,000 range. Uh, so I, 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 you know, that's where I'd put it. Um, I think it's just very dangerous because you got to think that we have 46,000 deaths, but it's only been about four weeks. You know, normally that 80,000 deaths for influenza, that's over a whole season, flu season. Um, so I think we're not out of the woods yet. We've got a lot more to do. Um, but you know that I hope that puts it in perspective for you. Do you have a sense of the as is often referred to the denominator here? It seems as though the more we learn about this, the more we're finding that more people have been infected and just were asymptomatic, didn't recognize they had this infection. Therefore, not that any death is less significant, but, but the actual percentage of mortality is much lower. That's exactly right. You know, there was a study done in Santa Clara. I'm sure you saw that, where they said that it was probably 85 times higher the number of patients that have it than than they thought. They found about 4% of the population. And it's funny, they did the same study down in in Los Angeles and found about the same or maybe more, um, maybe 50 times. Uh, 
Uh, and if you look at data out of Germany, where they just test an entire you know village, if you look at um, data from Switzerland, it's anywhere between five to fifteen to possibly twenty percent have already had it or been exposed. And I think we're not talking enough about it. And the problem is that if you say that, then it really lowers the mortality rate. And and I argue with these statisticians and epidemiologists on Twitter, they're debunking these, saying the methods were bad. And I agree they weren't done that well. That means people kind of volunteered to get this done, and that's a bias. But even without that, they, they just fear that if we say the mortality is lower because many more people had it, that everyone's going to relax. And I just don't agree mm-hmm. with, you know, politicizing data. Let's just take the data as it, as it is. And I think we're going to find a lot of people have had this. Let's talk about treatments and a vaccine. First of all, are you hopeful that we'll actually get a vaccine out of this that'll that'll work? I mean, we, we have a flu vaccine, but the flu vaccine is not uh, completely effective. And it's a lot of guesswork from what I understand of trying to determine which strains will be active in a coming season. So what are your thoughts on the vaccine? Well, we will have a vaccine, there's no doubt. Influenza, as you just said, we we take our best guess and we put three strains in there and we hope we get it right. We don't always do it. Uh, And I think we will have a vaccine. I think we'll have one before the end of the year, although I think uh, it'll be limited availability, but certainly early next year, I think it'll be widely available. Uh, From what I've read about the genetics of this virus, it hasn't mutated so dramatically that uh, we would have problems with the vaccine not covering the virus because it's already changed. So the good news is it seems pretty stable. Um, There have been some vaccine trials done with the MERS virus that was the earlier version of this, you know, the outbreak in Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Uh, And it did show that if you give a vaccine like this, we make antibodies. So I think I think we'll have it. I think it'll it'll work. But you know the ironic thing is just like influenza. You know, I just said 80,000 people have died at, at one time from influenza and wouldn't you know that only 50% of people get a, a flu shot. So the next thing to look at is whether people are going to take this vaccine. And I know parents are not going to, I already know some of them are saying they're not going to give it to their kids. Yeah, I have to I have to ask you this question. You may not want to comment, but uh, there are a lot of people that are now saying they will not vaccinate, in some cases right. at all. Um, in, in many cases, it's we'll, we'll do the basic vaccinations, but beyond that, we're not taking any of these quote-unquote optional ones. What are your thoughts on vaccinations? Well, I mean, I'm a proponent. I did extra training in infectious disease. You know, the guru when I was training at UNC Chapel Hill was Tony Fauci. You know, I treated early AIDS patients. So, you know, I believe in vaccines, uh, but I want to know they're safe. We certainly have had vaccines that weren't safe. Uh, We had a vaccine for respiratory syncytial virus in kids that ended up causing more deaths. So I, you know, I agree that we have to be thoughtful and they have to prove be proven safe. But um, if I haven't gotten it, so if I haven't gotten uh, COVID-19 by then, I would I would take the vaccine myself. I love that answer. Uh, let's talk about COVID-19 treatments. We've heard a lot of things being circulated. Is anything effective? And, and what are most physicians doing to help people who are really suffering from this? Well, you know, my doctors across the country, and I lead a national call with our doctors on what we should be doing every week. And I put out a one-page information sheet, and I haven't really had to update it now in four weeks, which is good news. Uh, And what we're finding is this. I mean, the best thing to take right now, if I had it, I would take remdesivir. Uh, The problem is it's very hard to get. You can only get it now through compassionate use. Hopefully, I've heard Gilead's making more uh, of the drug available. Um, But right now, unless you're in a clinical trial and it's hard to get in, uh, you're, you're going to have trouble getting it. But I do think that's the best. It's an antiviral. The next thing that people are getting is when you get this disease, after about a week or so, your immune system goes on hyper alert, and it starts to cause what we're calling a cytokine storm. So it attacks your body. It attacks your lungs. So ironically, we're giving some immunosuppressants in the more severe cases, one of them called tocilizumab, uh, and the other steroids, of course. 
Now, whenever you give an immunosuppressant in an infection, you worry you're going to make it worse, but appear, it appears that we, we are calming some patients down. Uh, they're on ventilators. They're very sick, but they seem to respond dramatically to this treatment. Uh, more has to be done to see on that. And I'd just like to make a comment. Hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, I'm not a fan of that combination. The NIH guidelines just came out and said they, dis- they, they don't recommend using it. It can cause arrhythmias when you use those together. I don't like the data on, on hydroxychloroquine myself. A lot of our patients are getting it, though, because they're asking for it. And doctors, my doctors, feel like they can't refuse it. Um, but I think that, you know, I recommended today on our call that no one get both of those. If you still want to get hydroxychloroquine, that's fine. Let's wait on some more data. But I don't hold a lot of hope out for that. But I haven't said don't use it to my docs yet. So if if I understand this correctly, and and um, and I've heard this from various sources, but the real threat of this disease is how the body's immune system reacts, and it actually seems to overreact and start attacking the body itself. Is that right? That's exactly right, and in particular, in particular, the lungs, and they develop this uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome where basically all the little fluid sacs in their lungs, the alveoli, they're all, they're all filled with fluid, and the inflammatory cells are there to fight it off, but they're damaging the alveoli. They're dam- damaging those little sacs, and the lungs become so tender, and it's so difficult to ventilate a patient when they get to that state. Uh, we're actually using inhaled nitric oxide to dilate arteries as a last-ditch effort to get more blood flow through the lungs and change the dynamics of the heart to get a little more oxygenation. But exactly right. The immune system is on high alert, and that's why we're using some immunosuppressants in, in these patients. The the one thing that, uh, I mean, obviously mortality is a very scary issue with this disease, but another thing we've been hearing snippets of is this idea that there could be uh, lasting damage from the disease. Have you heard anything that supports or refutes that? Oh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm looking at our patients. I review every single, uh, all our data every single day across our hospitals, and we're discharging a fair number of patients. I mean, we should probably, we should probably say that, you know, 80% of people, you know, they're getting better from this. And looking at our statistics, you know, our mortality now, if you, it just in our experience, if you come in the hospital, our mortality is 13% or 12% in that area. And so the answer is we're sending people home, we're extubating and getting them off the ventilator, but they do face a long, a long trial afterwards where their lung function is going to be, you know, 20, 30, 40% down. Um, they're going to have muscle weakness because they've been laying in an ICU. Uh, they've been on medications to sedate them and to relax their muscles so they could be on a ventilator. That causes a myopathy and your muscles atrophy. Um, and so, yeah, and not to mention the cognitive issues and psychological trauma, um, it's, it's a long road back. So if you've been seriously ill with this, this is not just you go home and you're better. You know, you're going to get you're you're going to be sick and and need uh, a long time to improve. So, what is the timeline if someone was to start to become symptomatic from that point until they actually start to feel rather? I don't know how long it takes to get to normal, but close to normal, at least that they can function. Is that a two or three or four week process? Well, if you're seriously ill and you're intubated on a ventilator, most of the patients on a ventilator they're not on for a day or two. Although early on, we were, we were kind of, the, the dogma was to intubate people right away. So you came in, they weren't that short of breath, their sats were low, they seemed comfortable, but nope, they had COVID to protect everyone and to, to protect the patient, boom, we intubate. Well, what we've learned a couple of weeks in is that we should wait on some of those patients, put them on oxygen put them uh, on high-flow oxygen, and we're able to keep them off the ventilator, which is so important. If you look at the data in New York, if you went on a ventilator in New York City, you had an 88% chance of dying. And so we've been teaching our doctors to try to avoid the ventilator, uh, which makes sense. But to get back to your bigger question, if you've been sick like that on a ventilator, I mean, you are talking about by the time you go home, 
because uh, you've probably been on a ventilator for three weeks. Uh, I mean, you're looking at a three-month course to, before you back to normal. Wow. We're going to be out of time here. I wanted to ask you about your book. I mentioned it in the beginning of our discussion, your healthcare playbook, Winning the Modern Game of Medicine. What's it about? Well, it's a book that I worked on with the NFL, and I use football to explain health care. Uh, that's the playbook analogy. Uh, it's very applicable now because, uh, you know, it, it tells you how to be safe in the hospital. Um, I talked about in the book about old Lester Hayes, who used to play for the Oakland Raiders, and he put so much stickum uh, on his hand, stickum to help him catch you know, in making interceptions, and he put it all over his uniform <laughs> that they actually banned it in the NFL. And I talk about that uh, as as bugs, viruses, they're sticky on your hands, and you got to wash your hands. So uh, I did talk about that in the book, um, but it's a great read, and it's a good way to understand healthcare. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been one of the most informative and grounded conversations we've had so far about this threat that we've all been facing for the last few months. I appreciate your time and all your work, everything you're doing, and uh, I do hope you'll agree to come back at some point. I'd love to. Happy to. Anytime. All right. Thanks very Oh, by the way, did you have a website? Because we had a web address that I couldn't seem to access. It's DennisDurrell.md.com. Oh, .md.com. Okay, that's probably yeah. why we weren't getting to it. All right, again, thank you yeah. so much. Great to talk to you, doctor. Sure, take care. Bye. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll bring our second guest of the evening in. We'll be talking with Dean Reuter. He is the author of a book called The Hidden Nazi, The Untold Story of America's Deal with the Devil. It's beyond reality, and we'll be right back. Looking for our guest's book? Go to Amazon.com slash shop slash JVJTaps. Our second guest of the evening is Dean Reuter. Dean is an author. He's also served in two federal government agencies, including offices of the Inspector General. He's been a counsel to the Inspector General and Deputy Inspector General, responsible for policing the use of federal funds granted and contracted through those agencies. He's written a book. It's called The Hidden Nazi, The Untold Story of America's Deal with the Devil. Dean, welcome to Beyond Reality. It's an honor to have you here tonight. It's great to be with you, J.B. Thank you so much. So, um... I've always heard the adage, in fact, growing up, my first boss, my first employer out of college used to say it almost every day, may we live in interesting times, and it certainly seems that w has never been more true than it is right now as we take a look at the world around us. Oh, that, there's no doubt about that. These are very interesting times. I myself am sitting in my home in northern Virginia. I haven't been in my office for five weeks. Um, working from home, um, kind of getting into a rhythm with that. But, um, and, you know, Northern Virginia is shut down. So is Washington, D.C. I guess, uh, you know, essential elements of the federal government are still working, but the rest of us are going to the grocery store and then going straight home. Yeah, and uh, we are doing that in New York as well. And, you know, we, we're still waiting for the giant hangover that's going to hit when all this starts to return to normal. But, I, you know, there's a lot of complaining on social media. There are a lot of people that are trying to determine how this will uh, affect their lives long term, particularly those who have lost their jobs. And I'm hoping that you can put some perspective on this for us. You've studied our the World War II generation. You've written extensively about it. You know, there were sacrifices made, and there are always sacrifices made during times of, of war, of especially all-consuming war like World War II. How does what we're sacrificing right now compare to what those folks had to go through? Well, I don't think it compares at all, uh, honestly. I mean, uh, I might not be typical of most people, but I'm living in a big house with my wife and my son and my dog and my cat. Um, we've got plenty of everything. The grocery stores are running a little short on toilet paper, um, but we have everything we need. Uh, and, you know, half the people in the country, I guess, are about to get a $1,200 check or a direct deposit into their bank accounts. Now, having said that, there are people that are miserable. Unemployment has become um, a real problem, and the, the national economy and the worldwide economy are really suffering as a consequence of the shutdown. But this doesn't really compare to the era of history that I studied, World War II, uh, where at the end of that conflict, you, you had 55 or 60 million people dead. Now, we're not at the end of the coronavirus uh, crisis, but uh, it doesn't look like it will be anything near 55 to 60 million people. There are some similarities. There are lots of contrasts. Yeah, and of course, if you even extend this to what the uh, majority of Europeans were dealing with during this war, I mean, 
you know, they were in many cases homeless and uh, refugees and had no support system whatsoever for, for many years, especially as the war was nearing its end. Well, that's right. And even after the war, J.P., I mean, the, the war was cataclysmic for Europe. Well, here on the home front in the United States, I mean, our, our uh, young men uh, had to suffer through the draft. They served overseas. Uh, a, hundred, a few hundred thousand people lost their lives, over 400,000 people here in this country as soldiers overseas. Uh, but in Europe, it was far worse, uh, not just rationing and blackouts, but constant bombing, uh, regardless of where you were in Germany. You could be on the side of the good guys uh, or the bad guys, regardless of where you were in Europe, I should say. Uh, London uh, experienced the Blitz in the Battle of Britain and terror bombing. This is the first war uh, where you saw uh, uh, militants on both sides uh, targeting citizens. And these were weapons in World War II that were really, really advanced compared to what happened in World War I. So this was uh, you know, torrential bombing, uh, fire bombing um, of citizens. And uh, you know, the numbers of bombing runs, the, the length of the campaigns of bombing were just astounding in Europe, in France, but also within Germany um, and all the Eastern European countries. So in that sense, I mean, there's just no comparison at all. You can, the, the closest thing we have in this country to that sort of example is perhaps 9-11, um, where, you know, the Pentagon uh, ended up being essentially bombed and the World Trade Centers ended up being bombed. But at, during World War II, in Britain, at the height of the war, um, there were maybe 90 missiles a week landing in London and Southampton, and uh, half a city block would just be shattered. And that was happening 90 times a week on an endless loop with no, uh, no end in sight for that sort of thing. And that's just the missiles. That doesn't include the bomber airplanes uh, during the early parts of the war. Yeah, and and you, were no better, you were no better off as a citizen of Germany uh, later in the war. Yeah, I mean, there were there were entire cities of Germany that were completely leveled um, from Allied bombing, you know, and a lot of that was an effort to try to get the population to turn against Hitler. Um, but you know, uh, tens of thousands of civilians lost their lives. Yeah, and that was that was the nature of the terror bombing by Germany of London. You know, Germany entered this war. Their real goal was to conquer Eastern Europe and expand the German living space, the Lebensraum. Uh, they ended up, uh, when they invaded Poland, making enemies of France and Great Britain um, and ended up fighting a, a war on two fronts. And uh, immediately uh, Hitler saw that he needed to get uh, Great Britain out of the war, and that's what the terror bombing of Great Britain was all about. It was, as you say, um, in the early parts of the war, trying to demoralize the English citizens and get uh, Great Britain to sue for peace so that Hitler could turn his full offensive in the direction of the Russians. We are, let me see here, if I can do some quick math, 50, 75 years uh, from the, almost, almost to the day, and we're pretty close uh, to, to the end of World War II in Europe. Um, what was it, May 12th? I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the date. Of, uh, May 9th. May 9th of 45. So yeah. we are near, very close to that day. Um, and uh, we, are, we have lost... A very large uh, portion of our World War II vets, and, and at one point I heard we were losing like twenty thousand a day or something like that. Um, so, World War II is starting in a way to fade from some memories. Um, and one of the one of the parts of World War II that should never fade, but sadly seems to be fading a little bit, is the Holocaust and what happened to um, six million uh, European Jews. And uh, many others too, uh, political prisoners, and uh, in some cases, uh, military prisoners. Um, that's starting to fade from people's memory. How dangerous is that? Well, that's. Uh, I mean, it's, it's as sad as it is dangerous, JV. It's it's very dangerous because people begin. To, it becomes easy then to deny the Holocaust. To um, from a perhaps most benign perspective, to try and make yourself believe that man can't do this to man, to the fellow man, um, when in fact they can. And that was one of the motivators for writing this book, frankly. My kids are 26 and 24, um, and uh, when I was growing up, I'm 59, it, you knew somebody who served in World War II. It That's was right. an uncle or a father or a grandfather. Um, you, you often knew people who survived the Holocaust, 
or family members who, who survived the Holocaust. Now it really is a textbook exercise where um, kids, uh, in my, my kids' generation, uh, 30 years and below, um, they don't know anybody who served in the war. It's just a uh, sort of an abstraction for them. And they have almost no awareness of the Holocaust. Uh, a recent poll, you know, the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Holocaust took place January uh, 27th of this year, and the polling numbers for the um, uh, younger generation, the people who didn't know what Auschwitz was or didn't know what the Holocaust was, is just uh, astounding and really scary. I mean, I think it was something like 65% of the people uh, polled below the age of 30 or so had never heard, didn't know what Auschwitz was, and 25% wow. didn't know what the Holocaust was. Wow. Um, that's tragic. That is tragic. And I have to say, I, I uh, have been a history buff since I was a little kid. Uh, I spent a lot of time studying and being fascinated by the Civil War. Then I moved on to World War II. And one of the reasons that happened for me is my father uh, was a musician, and he played um, with another gentleman who was a World War II vet. And this gentleman was a sax player. And when he was, he was captured during World War II, and he was held prisoner. And because he was a musician, and because he was a saxophone player, at, for some reason, I don't know the details of it, but the Germans actually cut part of his tongue off. And he came back, he l relearned how to play saxophone, he ended up playing in a band with my dad many years later, and I met the man, and that story prompted me to want to know everything I could about what had happened during World War II. And I imagine that did, there were a lot of stories like that that did a lot of that for a lot of people. Yeah, I think that's true of our generation. People had um, real stories with real human faces um, yeah. uh, that they could relate to personally. These were people they knew who had suffered greatly. Um, and as I said, now it's an abstraction for, for the younger generations. Um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to write a book not just about the war, uh, but about the Holocaust. And the figure we ended up with to, to tell the story, the principal subject of the book, a Nazi German general, uh, Hans Kammler, who we call the hidden Nazi, the title of the book, uh, it is a story that is so strange. Um, you know, it's all factually documented. We've got all the government documents to prove it all. Um, but if we, if we hadn't come across those documents and I read a book like this, I wouldn't believe it would to be true. I, I had to be involved personally in order to wrap my head around uh, just how astounding this story is. Tell us who Hans Kammler is or was. Tell us who he was. What's his story? Uh, was is the correct phrasing there. He was born in 1901, so he'd be 120 almost now. So uh, he's past tense. Um, born in what is now Poland in 1901. Um, he had an unexceptional childhood, but he came of age during World War I uh, as a German citizen. And um, he became a man as the war ended. He never served in the war, uh, but he joined the anti-communist after the war. And if, if your listeners are familiar with the way World War I ended from the German side, uh, the Germans really expected to win. And the loss was very sudden, very unexpected, and humiliating for the German people. Uh, they had never even fought a battle on German territory, much less lost a battle on German territory. They were supposed to win, and all of a sudden they've lost. And we think that helped, me and my, my co-authors and, and co-researchers believe that helped form Kammler. He became embittered, uh, like a lot of German citizens of that era, uh, and he became an ardent anti-communist. Um, he went on to study architecture. That was his, his craft uh, by training. He was an architect and an engineer. Um, he got a degree, two degrees in architecture, including an advanced degree. Uh, he got married. He was a family man. Um, he was married by the age of 29, so in 1930 uh, he's getting married. But by 1933, uh, just before Hitler becomes chancellor, Hans Kammler joins the Nazi party. Uh, and uh, the same year he joins the SS before Hitler becomes president of Germany. Uh, so he, Hans Kammler, that is, the hidden Nazi, he's an ardent Nazi. He's a true believer. He is not a follower, a mere follower. He's within the SS, and uh, your listeners probably know this, and you do too, J.V., probably, that uh, you know, to be a German soldier or a sailor, sailor was one thing. To be a Nazi was a different level of uh, barbarity, and within the Nazis, to be in the SS was the elite sort of central 
hardened, extremely ideological and cruel core. And it was within that core, the SS, that Hans, Ler, Hans Kammler rose uh, to the highest levels. In the final year of the war, he became an Obergruppenführer, which is the highest commissioned rank in the SS. Nobody's ever heard of this guy, unbelievably. But he became the highest rank commission officer in the SS. There was only one guy to receive that promotion in the final year of the war, and it was Hans Kammler. Uh, so that's who he was. Um, um, what he accomplished is a whole other story, um, both in the early parts of the war and the latter parts of the war. And uh, I'd be happy to go into that. Uh, yeah, we've got to go to break here in just a couple of minutes, so I don't want to uh, get into something that's going to require a lengthy answer. So let me ask this about him. Why is this figure, who um, seems to have been in the upper echelon of the Nazi command, why has he remained such... Uh, a mysterious figure and, and relatively unknown? Well, that's a great question, and the answer to that is pretty straightforward. It's because at the end of the war, he committed suicide. So he escapes justice, and historians never went looking for him. But the reports of his suicide uh, were made by his driver, um, and, uh, but he never produced the dog tags of the general or the sidearm or the papers, and that was the standard required practice at the time. You would take those three things, dog tags, uh, sidearm, and papers, to the Red Cross station or the nearest battle station. No body was ever produced, and a post-war search for the grave turned up empty. Uh, and this guy had the rank equivalent to George Patton. So losing his body in the field of battle was just unthinkable. And as we prove in The Hidden Nazi, his suicide was faked. Um, so that's why nobody's ever heard about him. Was he ever a battlefield commander, or was he always an administrative uh, officer? That's another good question, because very, very few people managed to accomplish both. But Hans Kammler uh, was is a terrible term to apply to him, because he was so despicable. But in that sense, he was a Renaissance man. Um, he was a battlefield commander at the end of the war when it came to Germany's secret weapons, including, in particular, the V-1 and the V-2 rockets, which we can talk about in detail Dean Reuter is our guest tonight. We're talking about his book, The Hidden Nazi. Um, the uh, book is The Untold Story of America's Deal with the Devil, and we haven't gotten to the part where America gets involved yet, Dean, but tell us a little bit more about the supposed suicide of uh, the uh, hidden Nazi, or of course, uh, the gentleman we're talking about, Obergruppenfuhrer Hans Kammler. Do we, did, was there a report as to how he committed suicide, supposedly? Yeah, his, so as the war's ending, if your listeners know, the war ended sort of in Bavaria, southern Germany, and Czechoslovakia. Hans Kammler, according to his driver, Kurt Pruk, finds himself in Prague, Czechoslovakia, uh, being surrounded by uh, Russians coming from one side, the Americans coming from the other. He manages to get outside the city, driving south, um, and then according to his driver, they stop for a roadside meeting with another general. Hans Kammler walks off into the woods, and... Uh, doesn't return, his driver goes and finds him dead by cyanide poisoning. Uh, that goes against everything we found to be true about the way Hans Kammler lived his life, uh, the energy, the, the survival, um, you know, his drive. He's just not the kind of person to commit suicide, and uh, indeed we found that wasn't the case. And I, I should add, you know, we, as we did our research when we're putting this book together, we reached out to the Department of Justice Office of Special Investigations and to those, of course, are the U.S. Nazi hunters, to the Wiesenthal Center and even the Mossad, and it, we confirmed that none of them ever hunted for Kammler. To paraphrase their response, what they told us was we had limited resources. We had to pursue living war criminals. Kammler was dead, uh, so we didn't pursue him. So uh, not only have the historians failed to pursue him, the uh, the key Nazi hunters around the world have failed to pursue him. Justice has failed to pursue him. So, and I really believe, and we can get into Kammler's role in the war, in the Holocaust, um, if, if he had been known to have survived the war in, in the years after the war, he would have been more sought after than uh, Joseph Mengele, he, the angel of death. He would have been higher on the lists than Klaus Barbie, even higher than and more barbaric than Adolf Eichmann, the head of the Gestapo. Uh, he was that bad a human being, uh, but everybody believed his suicide, so he never got on those lists. Well, let me ask a, a, a kind of an environmental question. At that point, the war is about to end. 
Germany is in ruins. There are refugees everywhere. How difficult and or common was it for uh, high-level Nazis, or maybe even not even high-level, just Nazi officers in general, uh, to take this type of action where they may fake their own death or f- fake their own suicide and escape somewhere? I mean, we, we, you know, we know, we kind of have an idea of where the upper echelon went and, and what their disposition was. But take, take a step lower than that. Was this something that was easily accomplished? It wasn't hard, believe it or not. For you know, 10, ten to twelve months before the war ends, pretty much everybody knew Germany was going to lose this war. Right. And the the most senior Nazi officers, those with means, those with something to trade, uh, those with something of value, began to make their own exit strategies. Uh, they got they got papers, uh, they got fake uniforms, uh, and they, they made arrangements to get themselves to safety. A lot of folks, believe it or not, were arrested. Key Nazis were arrested, put in detention camps, and sometimes just walked away or otherwise managed to escape. We did have Joseph Mengele in custody after the war, and we just let him walk away. Uh, And that happened. I was shocked to find uh, that there were so many wanted Nazi war criminals uh, that we had in custody that just managed to slip through our fingers. after we had them in custody. It's remarkable. So what was Kamler's role in the Holocaust? Where, where, did, where does he enter that picture? Uh, f- from the very, very beginning, J.V., I mean, uh, the, the Holocaust was sort of conceived by Adolf Hitler in 19, uh, the early 1920s when he's in jail writing Mein Kampf. He's envisioning the annihilation of the Jewish race. Uh, the war really doesn't start until 1939, but... Uh, six years before that, 1933 and 1934, Kamler's writing a treatise, which basically is the uh, realization, the detailed blueprint, I should say, for Hitler's vision of expanding Germany into Eastern Europe. Um, he, he lays out these detailed blue plans, uh, Kamler does, uh, to take over these countries and enslave the population uh, used that enslaved population to build German villas and cities and towns, not just rule over the local population, but enslave them and repopulate that entire countryside, um, the Baltic countries, Poland, the Ukraine, Crimea, repopulate that entire countryside with ethnic Germans, and in the process, kill the inhabitants. Uh, and this, by, by Kemmler's own uh, reckoning, would result in the deaths of 20 to 30 million uh, Jews. And this was 1933, 1934, long before the war ever began. Uh, so he was, he was, his thinking was that corrupt uh, and that depraved um, even before the Holocaust began. Now, most people um, think the Holocaust proper started in January 1942 at the Wannsee Conference. That is a conference you probably heard about where German leaders got together and, uh, according to history uh, came up with the final solution. Right. But what we have is a document um, signed by Hans Kammler September 27th, 1941, so four weeks before the Wannsee Conference. Kammler is identifying Auschwitz as the key camp, the key slave labor camp and the key killing camp. Um, and we've got the signed order with Hans Kammler's name on it. Um, four days after that, he sets up, stands up an architectural office at, at Auschwitz and names its director, Karl Bischoff, who's a Hans Kammler uh, deputy. And Kammler decides to double the size of Auschwitz, then redouble it, and then double it yet again. So wow. that it ends up being a camp that can hold uh, 250,000 people. And uh, he goes on from there um, to build out the killing camp and the slave labor camp. And he did this uh, not just at Auschwitz, he reproduced his work elsewhere. And it's one very, um, I think, distressing but colorful tidbit of information at this point um, were the references to Kamler by his SS colleagues. They described him as a deplorable human being, uh, even within the ranks of the Nazi regime. They, they used language like rare obstinacy, brutality, disdain, the worst person I've ever known. And these were words coming from SS officers who were uh, 
themselves murderous men within a ruthless regime uh, at war, accustomed to dealing with massive death, and they thought that Hans Kammler was the real bad guy. So uh, not only did he identify Auschwitz as the killing camp, he then designed the, the standard concentration camp barracks. The architectural director that I just mentioned, Bischoff, wanted to have brick barracks for inmates. Kammler said, no, we're going to have wooden barracks. They're cheaper. And this is where Kammler really made his, his name and came to prominence. Uh, he was, made himself famous for using standardized materials and processes, doing everything as cheaply and efficiently as possible. So we have these architectural drawings with Kammler's signature at the bottom uh, of a concentration camp barracks. And in the margin, 550 um, inmates are supposed to be housed in one of these uh, concentration camps barracks. And, and Kammler slices through the number 550 and writes in 774. Um, so an already overcrowded barracks, Kammler uh, puts an extra 30% of people in there, specifically with the idea that it's going to cause disease to run rampant and help kill these people. Um, so, uh, and then from there, uh, after designing the concentration camp barracks, um, he turned to installing the gas chambers and the ovens at these same camps, not just at Auschwitz, but at camps throughout Europe. And he wasn't doing this, J.V., from Berlin. Uh, he wasn't a bureaucrat, you know, uh, picking up the phone and, and making distant orders. He was, he was at Auschwitz weekly, sometimes daily. Uh, he had this nickname during this period. Uh, he was called Stabvok, which means dust cloud. And that describes his sort of frantic movement from one of these camps to the next to the next, trying to get all the implements of death uh, installed. And this is also a period where um, we found Kammler, we toured the east, you know, the German, the German army is, has conquered Poland, but now they're going through Russia. Mm-hmm. And behind the German army, uh, I imagine you've heard of the Einsatzgruppen. The oh, absolutely. Squads. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. So Hans Kammler made a tour of these countries as the Einsatzgruppen was proceeding through, and he actually studied the most efficient ways to kill people. Uh, there were uh, individual shootings of people, mass shootings, mass hangings. They had these box trucks called killing trucks, um, the equivalent of what we'd have as a box truck today where they would herd people into these box trucks, um, run the uh, uh, exhaust fumes into the box truck, and kill people that way. Uh, they had some other mobile gassing units. Kammler gathered all this information, brought it back to Auschwitz, decided that Zyklon B was the most efficient way to kill people, um, and then decided to use that at Auschwitz and at the other killing camps. Um, and, and he um, he also configured the camps, especially Auschwitz. Auschwitz was going to be a slave labor camp and a killing camp, so it's really more than just one camp. It had dual purposes. And as it was originally designed, there was a railroad track spur that came in and would deliver people to the slave labor camp. The people that were going to the killing camp, that was about a mile and a half away. And Kammler quickly realized, no, we need to flip those two camps. We need to have the slave labor camp a mile and a half away because those people are fit enough to walk the mile and a half. The people we're going to gas immediately are the women, the children, the elderly, the infirm. So he made, made clear that the killing camp had to be right at the end of the railroad spur to make it more efficient. And then he, had, he put the gas chamber in the basement of a building uh, with an elevator and the crematoria immediately above. And what you begin to see is this maniacal sense of efficiency applied uh, to the mass murder of an entire race. And it, it really is astounding. Industrialized killing—it's—it's it's unbelievable, and it seems to be, have done been done without a hint of hu- uh, humanity. And I know that sounds a little obvious, but how humans can lose their humanity completely is a question that's so difficult to answer. Well, and there's one. There's I'm glad you mentioned that because there's one very interesting uh, anecdote about Hans Kammler. I mentioned he got married at the age of 29. He went on to have five children. Two of his daughters died very young. Uh, one of them uh, was in the as an infant, a newborn, in the care of a nurse with many other children. Uh, 
uh, and the nurse left a bottle of chloroform open near the children, and the calmer baby was actually gassed. And huh. despite, despite that sort of tragedy, I never saw an ounce of humanity or empathy or sympathy in Kamler for the men and the women and the children that were sent into the gas chambers that, that he installed. I, I, I hear these stories, and I've heard a lot of these stories, and every one of them is equally disturbing and equally difficult to digest. Uh, as this man... Uh, went through this with such uh, callous efficiency. He also became involved in um, Nazi in Germany's uh, high adva- highly advanced weapons programs. Where did that fit into this? Well, before can I can I t- just briefly touch on slave labor? Oh, sure, yeah, please do. That. Yes, of course. I, I want to make sure your 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 listeners are are fully aware of the extent of his depravity because um, there was this um, uneasy tension in Germany. Uh, the folks that were really 100% behind the Holocaust wanted to kill all the Jews right away. The people that were most intent on winning the war saw some value in enslaving the most healthy Jews and using them um, for the, the war effort. Uh, and Hans Kommler ended up sort of straddling this um, tension and managing this tension. And what he ended up with were the killing camps alongside slave labor camps which were fed into German industry um, and pr- pr- actually produced uh, a stream of revenue for the SS. Uh, Kamler envisioned the SS becoming a, a stand-up, uh, independent, sovereign entity within Nazi Germany. A- and he did that by the SS is in control of these slave labor camps, um, and they were renting out the slaves, not just for SS construction projects that he headed, but also to German industry, to many companies, your, your listeners would know the names of today, and to the German government. So he was turning a nice profit um, with this uh, slave labor trade. Um, and that's how he managed to sort of straddle this uh, line. And, but it was clear he was able to enslave the population only with a view towards ultimately killing them all. Um, so... Uh, he built slave labor camps that were designed to work people to death. That was the goal. And for Kamler, uh, the death of a slave was a victory. It wasn't a tragedy. Uh, it, it was a loss of production, but he ultimately saw that as a victory. And we found slave labor camps. Uh, you know, there were some politician made a comment recently, I guess about a year and a half ago, about. Uh, some detention uh, camps on our south southern borders being like concentration camps, um, an ill-advised comment. But hmm. the the worst slave labor camp we found killed 80 percent of the prisoners in three months. Uh, so after three months, you had an 80 percent chance of being killed. Uh, now one one of these camps was, and there were thousands of these, but one camp was described as comparatively good and clean and. I calculated that it had a death rate of about 27%. So after a year, you had a 27% chance of being killed in a comparatively good and clean slave labor camp. So these were not nice places. These were horrid, horrid places to to try to exist. Um, Having said that, they were better than being marched into the gas chambers, of course. And I think that, um, I mean, I've seen a lot of Holocaust-related movies, but I think uh, Schindler's List does a good job of... of Kind of illustrating how those, how the uh, SS would basically rent you uh, labor at so much a day uh, to use in your factory. I don't know if you've got a better example of that, but I do remember that being discussed in Schindler's List. No, that's exactly the way this worked, and and, and so so Hans Kammler and the SS rented the slaves. They used them for their own construction projects. They rented them to the German government as well, and they also rented them to German industry. Um, and that money came back to the SS, uh, and their vision was to have an, an independent SS. A truly, I mean, if you if there's anything more fearful than a than an independent Nazi Germany, it's an independent SS within it. And the and one of the things that's always been remarkable about discussions of World War II was the technology that the Germans employed in in warfare, and they seem to have an edge on virtually every angle. Clearly, they didn't get the atomic bomb first, thankfully. However, um, in almost every other facet, they seem to have an edge. Uh, Was was Kammler involved in German high-tech weaponry? He was. 
He was. Uh, you know, he distinguished himself so well as, as a master of efficiency and killing in the Holocaust that, that he rose quickly within the ranks. And, you know, he also had this sort of golden ticket because he had joined the Nazi Party and the SS very early. Uh, he was seen as ardent within their own ranks. So um, he ends up, by the end of the war, in charge of all of Germany's secret weapons. This includes uh, the Messerschmitt jet, rock, uh, jet airplanes um, that were unique, uh, but it also includes anti-tank weapons and shape charges. It includes some veins of nuclear weapons research that we found that nobody else has talked about. But um, the thing we focus on a lot in the hidden Nazi are German rockets. Um, these were the, the vengeance weapons. Your listeners have probably heard about them, the V-1 and the V-2 rocket. Um, so I can set the stage to talk about those because you know, this is a point, um, the Versailles Treaty, uh, Germany was forbidden from rearming, but from the 1930s, early 1930s on, they started working on rockets. Um, there, there was no ban um, in, in the Ver- Treaty of Versailles from Germany developing a rocket program, which they did between the wars. Um, but as the war is sort of winding down, uh, everybody seems to know that Germany is going to lose the war. Germany forces, German forces were spread far too thin. Um, and, but, but the Germans clung to this idea that there was going to be a super weapon, a wonder weapon. Um, and most scholars and historians think that those references uh, are references to Germany's rockets. You know, Gar- Garbles was talking about them. Hitler was dropping hints about them in the speeches. Um, and that's, uh, that's what they were, these German rockets referred to as vengeance weapons. And they were supposed, they were called vengeance weapons because they were going to be Germany's answer to the bombing of German cities, cities by, the, uh, by the Allies. Um, so the, the two rockets I'll discuss very quickly. The V-1 was the German buzz bomb. Um, many people have heard about that. It was, an, it was a technological advance, but it was not extraordinary. We had nothing like it, um, but um, it flew uh, about 400 miles an hour, powered by a diesel engine, uh, it was a missile, so it was pilotless, but it had wings like an airplane. It sort of looked like a glider, um, and it could go about 150 miles, um, and that became unbelievably important after Germany lost air superiority. They couldn't fly bombers and fighter aircraft over Great Britain anymore, but as long as they were within 100 miles of London, they could launch missiles into London. And these V-1s were very cheap to make and very effective. They were basically plywood covered by sheet metal, and the um, Germans launched thousands of these into London. Um, the second rocket, the V-2, um, as, as I say in the book, if the V-1 was the Volkswagen Beetle of the war, the V-2 was the exotic uh, racing machine. It was fast, the V-2 was fast, devastating, but really expensive and somewhat temperamental. It was a supersonic liquid-fueled rocket, uh, JV, it was so far ahead of its time, it really didn't seem to belong on a World War II battlefield. Um, our scientists, the Western Allies scientists, including the Americans, didn't think a, rocket, a liquid-fueled rocket could be built. They thought it was not possible. They thought it was physically impossible. And, and in the end, it required the creation of thousands of new parts that all had to be perfectly coordinated and we talk about this at some length uh, in the book, The Hidden Nazi, uh, hundreds of pieces of technology that didn't exist before the war. And we're talking about uh, fuel injection and steering rudders and gyroscopes and uh, conquering spin and vibration and electronic fields. Um, you know, when I started looking at this rocket, I thought, okay, the V-2 is a big deal. It's a big rocket. It's probably as tall as a man or 10 feet tall. Uh, this was a 14-ton missile that's 46 feet high. So, oh, wow. Yeah, almost five stories high. It traveled, um, if, you, if they shot it straight up in the air, it went to a height of 128 miles above the Earth. Um, when they shot it at a target like London, it, it would travel as high as 55 miles and 3,600 miles an hour. So it would come down on its target uh, without warning. There were no defenses to this missile once it was launched. And they had mobile launching trucks. So they could set up a mobile launching truck somewhere in Western Europe, fire off two or three of these rockets, move the truck, and be gone before the Allies even knew where the rockets had come from. Wow. Um, and to give you some perspective, these were going uh, 
55 miles in the air. A modern aircraft goes about six miles uh, at altitude, and um, not 55 miles, yeah. and about six and about 600 miles an hour. These were going 3,600 miles an hour, and when they hit, they would dislodge about six million pounds of shrapnel and debris, and that's that's the equivalent of about two two thousand automobiles just whirling through the air, shrapnel and and debris, and they were firing thousands of these at London. They weren't they weren't terrifically accurate, but if you're launching at a city like Southampton or London, a large target like that, and you don't care whether you hit downtown or the east side right. or, or whatever, you know, you just throw as much of this as you can at the enemy, and that's what they did. Um, but these rockets were so valuable that uh, as the war's ending and everybody knew Germany was going to lose the war, everybody knew there'd be this mad scramble for this technology. Uh, the Allies wanted it, the Western Allies wanted it, the Soviets wanted it, uh, the United States wanted it. And Hans Kammler, because he was master of these rockets, he controlled the rocket team. And I thought, again, okay, there's a rocket team of maybe five or, five or ten guys who are designing these rockets. These are the guys who are putting these together. But it was hundreds of rocket team members um, working uh, from before the war in, in, on the Baltic coast of Germany, as far north in Germany as you can get, at a place called Pienamunda, a special purpose-built facility for rocket uh, launching and experimentation. They were launching these rockets into the Baltic Sea. Um, And as we show in The Hidden Nazi, Hans Kammler deliberately deliberately delivered that rocket team to the United States. Uh, Most people think we sort of just stumbled upon them, but there's this tightly sequenced series of events that show, that prove that he... He turned them over to us in order to try and save his life and rehabilitate himself. So the 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 title of the book is The Hidden Nazi, The Untold Story of America's Deal with the Devil. Was there a deal? Do we have evidence that this was a coordinated deal? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we prove it in the book. Um, so I'll, I'll walk you through. There's maybe six or seven steps. There's a, this is what I call this tightly sequenced series of events over a series of months. So... Um, <laughs> The, the, the V-2 starts being fired into London in October of 1944, so about eight months before the war ends. Uh, the next um, month, the Americans sign a contract with General Electric so that General Electric will build a V-2-type rocket. Um, so we get, we get our hands on the first ones that are landing in London. By November, we sign a contract with General Electric to build one. By December, just a month later, Kamler's emissaries are meeting in Lisbon, Portugal, with representatives of the United States government and General Electric. Uh, General Electric has just got the contract. A month later, they're meeting with Kamler's people in Lisbon on neutral territory. Oh, wow. And, and the war is still raging. This is December of 1944. The Battle of the Bulge is happening, um, and Kamler's negotiating with the Americans. Now, the rocket team is still on the north shore of Germany. Um, and the Soviets are approaching. So in January of 1945, one month later, Kammler signs an order to move the rocket team to central Germany to a purpose-built underground factory, the largest underground factory ever built, built by Kammler's slaves. Uh, he moves the rocket team down there in January. February of 1945, the Yalta Conference, if you know about that, that's when uh, the Allies got together and said, uh, described the post-war zones of occupation, right. who's going to occupy what. And it turns out uh, the place to which Kamler had just moved the rocket scientist is going to be in the Russian zone of occupation. So he's been thwarted. So six weeks after that, he signs another order and moves them to Bavaria. Now, he could have moved them to many, many other places, but where he ends up moving them is within about a week's march of the advancing U.S. Army. And that's the sequence of events that, that uh, we call the Kammler deal and cements the Kammler deal. Now, it doesn't make sense. The whole theory sort of falls apart when you think, well, Kammler went to Prague then and killed himself. Why would he do that if he'd made this deal with the Americans? Um, but, of course, it makes perfect sense when we discover the government documents that show he didn't die at the end of the war. He actually surrendered to the U.S. Army. Those documents that you're referring to, are they American documents? They're a mix of American documents um, and some German documents, uh, but mostly American documents. Uh, 
Um, and it took us forever to come out with these documents. We had to fight tooth and nail with the government. Uh, you know, I had I mentioned two co-authors and researchers. Uh, these guys are making visits to archives in Europe, here in the United States. We're making Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, uh, you know, finding documents at small libraries, small collections, uh, the Auschwitz, uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, but also military bases across the country. These documents are everywhere and and anywhere and sometimes nowhere. Um, very hard to get. But they're U.S. government documents that show we had Hans Kammler in custody long, long after his reported suicide. And we we know the story, or at least more of the story of Werner Braun, von Braun and the fact that he actually rose to become the head of NASA here in the United States. Uh, that in itself was in many ways a deal with the devil. Um, how far did Kamler get in whether it was U S uh, uh, in, in military or um, in, in NASA or other forms of officially sanctioned U S government projects? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have, by the way, we have a whole chapter in the book about Werner von Braun, who was the lead rocket scientist. He was the rocket genius, and if you could only get one guy after the war, he would be the guy you'd want. Did he answer to Kammler? He did. He did. He did. He worked for Hans Kammler. It was, he was one of the rocket scientists that Hans Kammler delivered to the United States. And it's only because we got that rocket team that we got to the moon first and that we got our ICBM, and I think helped win the Cold War. You know, there's an old Bob Hope joke that we got to the uh, moon because our Nazi scientists were better than the Russians' Nazi scientists. And there's a lot of truth in that, that sort of humor. Um, but it was Hans Kammler that gave us Werner von Braun. And, you know, Werner von Braun, as you say, became an American hero. Uh, but our chapter in the book uh, presents a lot of new evidence uh, that indicates that von Braun knew a lot more about the Holocaust and knew a lot more about the use of slave labor and endorsed it, and even on occasion personally went and recruited a couple of slaves to work on his rocket projects. And for years after the war, he was withholding documents from the Americans. So we've got a whole chapter in there that's an indictment of von Braun and presents a lot of information that, 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 that shows that he's not quite the American hero everybody thinks he is. Why did there seem to be a period of maybe indifference to this information? And now it seems the Von Braun story is being told and retold. Your uh, your book talks about the Kamler story, but people are starting to now second guess or maybe have what I would consider to be some remorse for embracing these war criminals. Yeah, well, I think if you understand, and, and I'm clear in this book to, to be careful not to second-guess the decisions that were made right at the end of the war. Yeah. Because as the war is ending, everybody knows that Russia is going to be the existential threat. They were, and I mean an existential threat, they, they, their vision of, of the world was incompatible with the United States and American freedom. They wanted to annihilate us. And it was in that context that we started recruiting Nazis not just to build rockets, not just to build, uh, help build our nuclear weapons and perfect all our science and technology, uh, everything from weapons to nylon to synthetic fuels and synthetic rubber. Um, uh, but we recruited Nazis as well as intelligence assets on the continent, and we used them for years, RV, RJV. Um, and uh, we were unapologetic about it. Now, as time passes, the people who are responsible for making those decisions, uh, they pass away. Um, the the sort of uh, sense of urgency of the moment, uh, you know, you can't recreate that today. You can't necessarily put yourself into the shoes of those people and realize right. they were they had a mortal fear uh, of the Soviet Union and felt like the Soviet Union was going to sweep through Europe, uh, take over Great Britain, and then leapfrog to the United States. Um, so, uh, in that context, it's very difficult to second guess these sorts of deals now. Uh, with the passage of time, um, it's 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 now possible to examine them in sort of a cold, um, dispassionate way. The um, story continues, and uh, Kamler was kept where? Did, was he in a prison? Was he in an office? Was he in uh, in a witness protection program? How did that work? 
Yeah, so according to the German courts, he committed suicide in May of 1945. That was adjudicated by the German court. Um, we actually uh, had him from that point forward uh, until March of 1946. And our documents show that he was interrogated in central Australia, Aust- Austria rather, sorry, um, uh, central Austria about missing money, um, missing uh, German funds, uh, that he was moved to central Germany to that one rocket science uh, uh, center I mentioned, and we think he was there being interrogated about scientists that still might be in that area that we were trying to locate before the Soviets took that zone of occupation over. And then we have documents that suggest, I wouldn't say prove, but that suggest strongly that he was at Nuremberg on the eve of the Nuremberg trials. Mm. Uh, probably giving some testimony to support the prosecution of some of his fellow Nazis. Um, And uh, that would have been November of 1945 uh, that the Nuremberg trials began. And then we had him through February of 1946, so now fully 10 months after the war. And then there's a, a, and in the file, there's an extradition request from Great Britain where they want us to turn Kamler over. You asked me a question I haven't yet answered about whether or not he had a battlefield command. Uh, when, when the V-2s were being launched, Kamler was actually in the field of battle in charge of the launch troops at times. So he did have a battlefield command in that sense. And for that reason, at least in part, Great Britain wanted Hans Kamler, and they made extradition request in February 1946, That's in the file, and there's a note saying, we have no objection to the extradition of Hans Kammler. And then, poof, the paper trail just evaporates. It's as if the guy never existed. And there's no indication, there's no concrete indication that he went to Great Britain or that he went to South America with our help or that he stayed in Europe or that we brought him to the United States. And from that point forward, we lay out three different scenarios, and we tell the reader what we think is what most likely became of him after that. Can you tell us what the status was of the Nazi nuclear program at the end of the war? Were they close to having the bomb? Well, you know, that's a great question. And, and we, don't, we don't suggest that they were close. Uh, we suggest they were closer than conventional history reports. And, you know, I make that case. Um, I think what, I, what I'm most comfortable saying is that, you know, the Americans came to this conclusion that Germany never got close to a nuclear weapon. And what, what we do is examine the way that the United States came to that conclusion and just completely destroy that theory. Um, it, it's, and it's not that complicated. There were basically uh, two threads of evidence that the United States relied on to conclude the Nazis had not advanced very far in nuclear research. The first were these... Um, secretly recorded audio tapes of the Nazi nuclear scientists that were captured and then detained at Farm Hall in England. It was a detention camp, really a manor, an English manor in England. The problem with relying on those audio tapes was that the Nazis knew they were being recorded, and they came up with a rehearsed excuse for their research called De Lizard, meaning that translates as the version. Um, and uh, so, so they knew they were being recorded. They weren't being honest in their discussions, and not even all the Nazi scientists were even there. Um, and these were not even complete transcripts, um, but summaries, and not all of them survived. So relying on those statements to come to any sort of conclusion is just crazy. The, the second um, thread of evidence uh, that we rely on in concluding that, that the Americans relied on, including Germany made no real progress, was this group called ALSOS, A-L-S-O-S. This was a group, uh, a special set of scientists that followed Allied troops in the final stages of the war as, they, as we reclaimed German-held territory uh, to determine just how close they came. That was their job. Um, they, they came up through Italy and then up through France, um, and they tried to investigate all the nuclear research science, which sounds like a great idea, but the leader of the effort complained that there were more sites and more information than any team could analyze. Wow. Uh, and they found that many of the sites they tried to analyze had already been destroyed or had been evacuated by the Germans, or 
uh, their documents um, or whole installations were pilfered by our side. You know, we'd get some young soldiers in there who'd get there before the Alsos team. They'd see some nice equipment. They'd beat it up or try to destroy it or steal what looked shiny and, and fancy <laughs> and interesting. Um, and and Alsos never looked at anything other than the territory that the U.S. government would control. Um, yet they concluded that they concluded definitively that Germany made no real progress. But they never, and they made that conclusion even before they got into Germany. So um, the idea that they didn't make um, progress, we undermine that completely. And then we do present some evidence about a calmer think tank. Um, which sounds as ominous as I think it really was, which existed in Czechoslovakia, in Prague. Um, and I don't know how much time we have left, but um, I-, I can give you, uh, you know, a, a two-minute story on Stechevikes, which is in Prague, JV. Um, yeah, let's do, let's do the two-minute story, and then we're going to have to get close to wrapping things up. Sure. So th- this is what I would say is, is, is not proof that they were, were doing nuclear research, but proof that they were doing something unbelievably sophisticated and important. Um, and it's called the Stechevice Raid. Um, <laughs> um, after the war's over, you have to imagine the war's ended, hostilities are over, we send, we the Americans, send five trucks into Russian-occupied territory, into Czechoslovakia, and these trucks go with one Nazi uh, officer in, in, in the company, um, and they go to uh, this underground cavern that's an SS-built cavern that's booby-trapped, and th- they have bomb diffusers. Uh, they open up this cavern. They extract 42 boxes of documents and take them by truck out of Czechoslovakia back to the American zone. Um, they're discovered um, uh, days later, and the documents are returned and, uh, to Czechoslovakia, but it, we're never told what those documents were. But you have to imagine this is in the backyard of Kamler. Mm-hmm. This is where his think tank was. These are documents at an underground facility that he would have built. Um, uh, the SS helps the Americans find them. And it never reported what it was in the documents, but they had to be important enough that the Germans had a special built underground cavern for them, booby-trapped them in a way that they would be destroyed. Um, uh, and the Americans felt they were important enough to make this post-war incursion uh, into Czechoslovakia. Um, and after the Iron Curtain fell, we had another uh, jet propulsion laboratory search of that area, which is fascinating. So um, not absolute proof that yeah. the Nazis were on the cusp of, 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 of creating a bomb, but uh, those are strong indicators. I have four more questions. I'm hoping we're going to be able to get them all in. And this one I have to ask because frequently on this this show we talk about metaphysical things. Um, there's reports that the Nazis were trying to find some occult connections and some some more metaphysical um, studies. Did Kamler have anything to do with that? Did you discover any of that in your research on him? You know, we really didn't. Um, and and I have to say, I didn't. I would didn't go looking for that. But I will say that he was in charge of, quote-unquote, all of Germany's secret weapons at the end of the war. Everything that was exotic or cutting-edge, he was in charge of it. Uh, so if somebody wants to go looking for it, I'd start by looking at Kamler's portfolio. This is an amazing story. What brought it onto your radar? I mean, again, this is, this is the most uh, dangerous man we've never heard of. Yeah, I agree. I've, so I mentioned my two co-authors and, and, and co-researchers. One of them is Keith Chester. I've known him since I was in college. He came to me a dozen years ago uh, because he heard of this Nazi general. He was doing online research, trying to find out more about him. He came across our other researcher and co-author, Dr. Colm Lowry, who's in Northern Ireland, um, and they realized they were both researching the same general. Keith came to me as a lawyer and said, can you write an agreement so the two of us can share our research with each other without stabbing each other in the back? And so I agreed to do that. And then Keith started telling me, he fed me bits and pieces of this story about this all-powerful, all-evil Nazi general nobody's ever heard of. I was unbelievably skeptical, J.B., I have to tell you. I thought, there's just no way uh, that a story this big and this fascinating hasn't been written about yet. Um, uh, but I went from 
from skeptic to principal author as they kept kept giving me more and more of this information, <laughs> and I started doing research of my own. Now, you, in part of your research, you were uh, able to talk with uh, Kemmler's son. Is that right? Yes, that was that was a chilling experience. Yeah, I, I bet. Was, I was in Germany. His son is in is in northern Germany. Um, I had been in touch with him by email. I'd asked to meet with him, and and he never agreed to meet with me. And I just decided I'm just going to go to this guy's house and knock on the door. And uh, you know, he was by this time uh, an older man himself. And I met with him in his darkened parlor. He sat in what really was his deathbed. Um, he he sat in a hospital bed in his darkened parlor. And we talked about his father and his legacy and the kind of man his father was and what sort of childhood he had growing up. And interestingly, his mother, so this is Hans Kammler's wife, lived with this son until 1996. She didn't pass away until 1996. Wow. So it was that 50, uh, 50, 51 years after her husband's suicide. Um, and she never remarried. She never remarried. And... The son was clearly asking me for information about their father. Although the family had him adjudicated dead, they never believed he was he, he was dead. Well, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, if if you were if you if you fake your own death in any fashion, it seems as though the the temptation to contact your family would be overwhelming. At some point, you'd want to reach out to them, and uh, from what you know, they, they they never heard from him. Uh, that, that's right. So, uh, let me say that. At the end of the war, when Kamler supposedly faked his death, the son that I spoke to was only five years old. He was just a child. Yeah. So there's no way he's going to be told that his father's death was faked. Uh, you just couldn't trust a child with information like that. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the mother didn't know and if the mother had some sort of intermittent contact. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the things we did come across was were plans for a Fourth Reich and uh, proof that you know, by 1943, for example, Germany had shipped out of Germany more gold than it possessed before the war. And uh, this fabulous meeting that happened among German uh, industrialists and German government leaders about offshoring technology and gold and assets uh, in, in, in anticipation of the Fourth Reich. So it's very possible, in my mind, uh, that Kamler was part of that network in South America and had opportunities to contact his wife. It's not surprising to me that you, you know, you couldn't tell a son at five, so you wouldn't tell him at ten, and then really couldn't tell him at fifteen. And by the time he's twenty or twenty-five years old, he's a communist. He's a he's a uh, he's an anti-fascist. He's a communist. Um, Hans Kamler's son was. Um, so at that point, you really can't tell him either. So. Well, um, we're basically out of time here, but I've got to ask you about another uh, prominent Nazi. This one I think most people have heard of, but uh, the story of Adolf Hitler's demise has been called into great question, and um, it seems to be the evidence now completely refutes the uh, official account of what happened in the bunker at the end of the war. What are your thoughts on the the um, the uh, disposition of Adolf Hitler after the war? So I haven't studied that in any in any scholarly sense. I will say this: that you know, I thought it impossible that somebody like Hans Kammler, at his rank, could have faked his own suicide. Right. And we, and we prove that he not only faked his own suicide, he did it in a deal with the United States. Um, and I would layer on top of that when it comes to Hitler, the things that happened in the in what became the Russian zone of occupation. Um, Iron Curtain is, is just a great uh, metaphor for what rose up there after the war. We just don't have a lot of uh, clarity about what happened in what became the Russian zone of occupation, and it was the Russians that took over Berlin and uh, you know, resolved things, quote-unquote, at, at the bunker. And, of course, uh, what uh, information we have at this point is sketchy at best, and it seems as though the evidence they use to identify the corpse in the, uh, in the uh, courtyard of the bunker seems to be very, very unreliable. So that's, I guess that's a mystery we may never have an answer to. I would say that given what, I, what we found in the hidden Nazi, I'd say almost anything is possible, J.B., Really. This book sounds fascinating, Dean. Where can people buy it? I know you mentioned it before, but let people know again where they can get a hold of this book. Now's uh -huh. a great time to be reading a good book. 
It is, and it's a good introduction to World War II and the Holocaust for people who, who, who don't know about it, because we, we paint some general uh, broad strokes in the beginning. Uh, at Amazon.com, uh, BarnesandNoble.com, any bookstore, if you can actually get into a bookstore, but it's everywhere you can buy books, you can find this. And, and I, as I said at the outset, it's been really well received. Yeah, and I love your perspective on this, and I love the fact that you have enough passion to pursue it. Uh, so I have to ask, any other projects on the horizon? Well, so a lot of people have said this book ought to be turned into a Netflix eight-part series or a uh, mm. or a major motion picture. So we've gotten lots of interest from documentary filmmakers, but not yet from 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 the Hollywood types. So my next project is getting this turned into that. Um, and then I'll have a next, next project, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> well, we hope you'll let us know what it is, and you'll come back and talk about that project when it happens. And best of luck with the book. This is this is a fascinating story, and I'm glad uh, you were brave enough and uh, um, dedicated enough to tell it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a, a lot of fun being on with you, J.V. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.